just want to lay a very short foundation um, concerning the person of the Holy Spirit, but I want to labor in a direction that the Lord is moving in. Uh, and I trust that He will bring a lot of clarity uh, as we engage on this subject. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 14. Can we go a bit further? 
one of the uh, various controversies and debates you'll come across uh, has to do with things like why doesn't the Holy Spirit have a throne in heaven? A scripture shows us clearly there's a and it's, it's actually a very ridiculous argument because when you read the scripture, the context through which uh, the Lord is uh, revealing, in a sense, the ministry that is coming of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, he makes a parallel first of his relationship with the Father. That you are asking to see the Father, but in seeing me, you have seen him. So the emphasis of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily to isolate him from the Trinity because in the Trinity you see the oneness. In actual fact, the emphasis of the doctrine should be that it's difficult to separate them because that's how scripture is presenting it. Can we go further? I hope I'm not losing you. So when you see the model of Philippians 2, uh, getting, uh, it talks about Jesus being in very nature, God. But it's very seldom where you find Jesus uh, exemplifying himself as the ultimate, the end all be all. He comes in emphasizing another. That's the essence of the doctrine of the Trinity. That though they are distinct in personality, the emphasis, uh, the emphasis is oneness. No one is coming out trying to show of himself. They speak of each other. So Jesus, his core message is the doctrine I preach is not mine. It belongs to the Father. The Holy Spirit comes in, hey, everything Jesus. So they are in perfect harmony. Are we all together so far? I want to journey into a different direction where I believe the Lord uh, has his emphasis tonight. It's, it's very possible to do spiritual things in a carnal way. It's very possible to engage with the scriptures, missing the person of the scriptures. It's very easy to become a Pharisee. It's very easy to engage prayer with a heart that is distant. And that's what I want to labor in today because I feel like a generation does not know the danger of spirituality fibered in carnality. That you are moving, you are bragging about your prayer life that is six hours every day, but there's no trace of a consecration of intimacy. How buwa, rudwa, a nature that does not belong to God. We feel your flesh coming through and not his love. I hope you hear me. I hope you hear I, I don't mean to come down very harsh on you, but I, I feel a strong emphasis from the Holy Spirit in this direction. You know, Part of the reason for that is engaging with God from an unhealthy heart. And by an unhealthy heart, I mean a heart that wants to attain the things of God by the strength of intellect, the strength of the flesh, the strength of my knowledge, and not based on the foundation of his love for you. That's how you find a lot of believers crashing into burnout in their relationship with God. Because you are doing it from a wrong place. I hope I'm not losing you. It, it's, if you will indulge me, the Pharisees were experts in the law. If there's something that they knew well, it's the scriptures. And when the personification of that which they have studied all their lives arrived, they could not see him. And when he plainly explained himself to them, they defended their stance based on the scriptures that he is not the one. So you can be very diligent in your scriptures and miss the person. Because the point of what we do is not to be good preachers. I hope you're hearing me. The point of what we do is not to release a good album as a worshiper. You will get infested by the lights of things and lose the person of the things. That was never the point. 
In actual fact, the ministration of the fivefold is a ministry that we are working ourselves out of a job. It's a problem if even we, the preachers, want to be the end all, be all. It doesn't work that way. We are missing a critical ingredient in the nature of the one that we're speaking of. So it's very simple to get up in the morning and orientate your prayer life around I have to do an hour of tongues before I go out. And the whole time you are praying in tongues, there's no affection in your heart. It's from a religious obligation. When you interact with believers, I, 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 I know that you guys can relate to this example, where uh, uh, because I do not struggle with something that is an evident struggle with you, I come with the brunt of the truth that does not come from a place of love. Meaning I'm depending on something other than the love of God as a foundation. And that's why I burn you with my words. Am I saying we don't speak the truth? We do. But we speak the truth in a place called love. There's a baptism you undergo before you come and relay truth. It's the kind of baptism that when someone struggles with a thing, when you relay the truth, you identify so deeply with where they are. My goodness, man. You, you, you almost cry and weep because of where they are. And whatever decision they make, whether they choose Christ or not, your love remains. That's one of the key identifiers that this person is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a charisma thing per se, because the, the consecrations of giftings are cheap. You can operate in a word of knowledge outside of love. You can operate in prophecy outside of love. You can last year and still give a prophetic word that is accurate. So the consecrations of giftings are cheap. We don't measure a person's infilling of the Holy Spirit based on the utterance of tongues. The measurement is Galatians chapter 5. The fruit you exhibit. That's an identifier that I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Where do you see it clearly? In matters of character. When we speak love, we see you. When we speak uh, generosity, we see you. When we speak self-control, we see you. Every, every fragment of the, the fruit of the Spirit that is exhibited in the Scriptures, we see in you. That is the clearest marker that this person is filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm just burdened with this in my spirit. I feel like we are losing an entire generation because we have lifted up the things that don't matter as though they are the end all be all and the critical components we have ignored. Can I give you a disturbing reality? That you can be so advanced in proper doctrine and still miss God. but you are seeing it everywhere you go that the rightness of the utterance of Christ is in the mouths of the preachers but the fruit is nothing there's no fruit can we journey some more so what we do when we teach particularly regarding the person of the Holy Spirit is that we We don't teach him as a wind. We don't teach him as an atmosphere. We don't teach him as a power. We don't teach him as an it. We don't teach him as your errand boy. That when you have a qual with someone you don't like, the Holy Spirit must stand up and take charge. We, we don't teach him like that. We teach him as a person we revere. We don't teach him as a lesser God. We teach him in his full office of being God. Romans chapter 8. Don't worry. 
want you guys to be deceived, man. We've, some of you guys have been in church all your lives and you've, you've seen enough to write an entire book. As a, as a minister of the word, as a preacher, you get to the place where you, you get tired of the fickle. You get tired of the things um, that don't matter. It's either we're doing this thing all out or we're not. We, 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 we're not in this thing for money. We're not in this thing for fame. We're not in this thing for popularity or anything like that. We, we are in this thing for real. You know, we are not this in this thing for a good sounding uh, worship team. And, you know, we are in this thing for real. And I believe if we come in with the right mindset, it will reset how we do church entirely. Because the, the little things are report card to us that we have no problem in arriving here late. In our minds, in our minds, God arrives maybe when the preacher ascends or when the worship team comes to minister. But, but we, we don't understand the degree of reverence that when we set a time for God uh, in terms of services, that he arrives before all of us. We don't serve him in the capacity of neglecting him in secret and engaging him openly because we want to show forth a performance. We don't do that. So it's either we get it right or we just leave this thing. Yeah. 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 I think, let me just skip the scripture because oh, this church is um, touched on it. And as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. Uh, let's go to Second Corinthians chapter 10. This is the essence of what the Lord has placed in my heart.
uh, adulthood uh, to where I am now. Everything, even my family, got one statement almost they can't receive. Meaning within their mind is a fortified structure that is making it hard for the truth to penetrate. They are living in a reality that does not exist. But they are living in that reality as though it's the truth. Coming back into the body of Christ now, we have large gatherings. But if you are to have personal conversations with people, you have a vast majority that disqualify themselves from a relationship with God. It's a fortified stronghold. So what do we end up doing? We end up waking up in the morning, doing an hour of tongues, trying to earn his presence. We, 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 we sing a lot of songs, not from the place of being in him, but from the place of journeying to being in his presence. As though it's possible in this covenant to be outside. We have jargon like, let's get into the spirit. But Romans chapter 8 is telling you where you are, that you are in the spirit. But to people like that, you will call them arrogant. Because you, you see as humility distance from God. So as long as you have the jargon of, yeah, kesasa. I am a sinner. Look, you've been saved for five years already. You still have that language. What is that? It's a stronghold in your mind. An undeserving perspective of the presence of God. And that's what I feel that the Holy Spirit wants to minister to. That he wants to make it known that you are mine and I am yours. That this truth that you are harboring it's not the truth at all. It's a stronghold that is a mechanism of distance. Just reason with me for two minutes. Why on earth would God do away with sin? Is it not because it was the weapon of distance? Why is it that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that we have a gospel of reconciliation? Uniting humanity with the Father. And why is it that we still have a perspective of distance? Oh. <clears throat> I'll leave you with one key. The one key to healing this is called vulnerability. The Lord never devised a prayer life that is based on you being okay all the time. And you can see what it's doing to us because so long as your prayer life is based on the good things, you can relate with him. But when something happens, it's hard to approach him in prayer. But in an issue, make this as simple as possible, man. When my daughter runs to me, whether she's happy or whether she's crying, I rejoice that she's coming to my presence. My delight as a father is being with her. Her delight is being with her father. So David becomes the perfect model of how to navigate this relationship with the Lord. He is a model of, I will be as transparent as op and open as possible, but I will also give you the room of giving me your perspective. Father, my enemies are, are prevailing. Cause is chowing me. <laughs> And you stay in that place and he ministers back to you. What that foundation does is that it teaches you the joy of his presence. Therefore, you don't have to encourage believers to pray. It's the one thing you fall in love with. It becomes your relationship with the Holy Ghost becomes the end all be all. That before a day begins, you are there. After 
after a day ends, you are there. During the day, every interval you get, you go to the bathroom two minutes. I just love you. I adore you. You are everything to me. Prayer becomes a delight and it doesn't become a chore, which is what is happening in our generation. We are flossing tongues to each other. We are bragging about spirituality. We are bragging about each other's sermons. We are competing because we are not doing things from a place of love. So he teaches you vulnerability. The Holy Spirit will invade your space. He, he, he is so gentle. But also, he's the person that can have hard conversations with you. That my brother, you are holding on to this thing that happened with your father. But I am not your father. Why are you distant? He makes you sit in emotions that are heavy. But he surrounds you with an atmosphere of safety so that you may know that I don't intend to kill you. I'm trying to push you from a place of distance into a place of intimacy. I know you are having a hard time because you were violated at a young age, but I am not your violator. Come talk to me. Come talk to me. And you know that he's speaking to you because he starts to raise emotions and you start crying and the first thing you want to do is what you've been doing all along. You want to run. <laughs> you want to run away but he's drawing you closer and he wants to deal with that heavy thing in your heart because he doesn't love a relationship of distance between you and him. He will always gun for the idols even if the idol is pain. I know you are in the room. I'm speaking to you. Even if the idol is pain, he will gun for that. Because if pain becomes a mechanism of distance between you and him, he will have a problem with it. So where we are in this service is a confrontation. I feel like the Lord is raising heavy things that happened in your past. Because he wants to break down the wall of distance. My goodness, man. Hey, can we stand on our feet? Time is up.